Hey everybody, it's Dan the Chess Enthusiast, and I'm here with the Grandmaster game for the Alakines Exchange Variation. Uh, so, in this uh, video we're going to go over a game that was played between Ivar's Gitzlis as white and Bent Larsen as black, played in Sousse, Tunisia in 1967. Now, uh, before we get started, I just want to say really quickly about Bent Larsen. He was a Danish Grandmaster and uh, was really popular in the 1950s and 60s and is actually credited with helping to develop a lot of the modern theory of the Alakine defense. It was one of his favorite defenses to play. And uh, actually before the uh, 1960s, the late 1960s, before Bobby Fischer burst onto the scene in international chess from the U.S., uh, Larson was actually considered a contender for the title strongest player outside of the Soviet Union. So uh, Larson was definitely a strong player, and I chose this game to go over because one of the features that I haven't uh, quite addressed uh, directly in my other videos about the Alakine is that um, both players do not want to play passively because uh, black is essentially giving white the center, and uh, white needs to hold on to that center. And in order for uh, black to undermine the center and white to hold on to it, both players need to play not aggressively, but simply they can't play passively. They can't just uh, make a lot of waiting moves and waste a lot of moves. And in this game, as we'll see, uh, White actually ended up doing just that. They made a couple of moves that were uh, questionable. I don't know quite what they were thinking. And uh, it allowed Larson to swing the advantage over to his side and eventually get the win. So uh, let's get started. I should say that the game is kind of long, so I'm going to keep the commentary down to a minimum because of the time restraint on YouTube. And uh, so let's get started. So we have uh, the King's Pawn opening to e4, knight out to f6. Uh, first couple of moves are pretty standard. Um, although we do have a, a move order switch up uh, right here as opposed to pushing the pawn immediately to c4. We have the pawn to d4. And in response to that, Larson uh, pushes its own pawn, uh, his own pawn to d6. And then now we have the pawn coming to c4 and the uh, Knight jumps back to b6, and this is the standard setup for uh, most Alakine's uh, defense openings. Uh, from here, you can either push the pawn to f4, or as white opts to in this game, uh, simply captures the pawn on d6. From here, uh, white recaptures, uh, I'm sorry, black recaptures, white develops this knight out to c3, and black puts his bishop on e7. Now, remember that in uh, the last video uh, we talked about in a lot of the lines and variations that we looked at, uh, this pawn ends up coming to g6 and the bishop ends up getting fianchettoed. And what the fianchettoed bishop does is put a lot of pressure on the d4 pawn right away. But that's not what uh, Larson opted to do here. Instead, he opted to play his bishop uh, right out to e7, probably said he could castle sooner. From here, uh, white responds with its own bishop out to e3 now. Black castles. White develops his bishop to e2. Uh, black develops the knight to c6. We have knight out to f3. Bishop down to g4. Uh, we have pawn to b3. Remember, we talked about that in the last video. That's necessary because if white, uh, I'm sorry, if black decides to capture this knight, uh, white either has to capture with the bishop and then drop the knight, the pawn here on c4, or recapture with the g pawn, and then that screws up its castle position. So that's why we're seeing pawn to b3, simply adding another defender to the pawn here on c4. From here, uh, we have the bishop to f6. So now the bishop is putting pressure on the pawn here on d4, except that again, I should note, it's not fianchettoed, which is what we usually see in uh, the exchange variation of the alakines. From here, white castles, and black pushes the pawn to d5, white pushes the pawn to c5, and uh, black retreats the knight to c8. Now here, uh, white kind of made its first passive move, and white ended up playing uh, pawn to b4. Um, I think actually, though, if we go back, a better move in this position would have been just to try uh, to put the question to that bishop right away and play something like h3. The bishop can either jump back to e6, or it could even exchange itself for the knight here on f3. Um, but it is uh, it is kind of pushing the, uh, kind of forcing the issue a little bit, whereas uh, the pawn move that was played before doesn't really do a lot for uh, white in this position. Yes, it adds another defender, but... Uh, 
this uh, pawn here on c5 is already defended twice uh, by the pawn here on d4 and then indirectly by the bishop here on e3. So I'm not quite sure that pawn to b4 was uh, the best move in this position. Now, uh, if you're black and you're looking at this, you might be thinking that uh, you have a, a pawn that's free for the taking on b4. But actually, if black were to capture that pawn, then the queen would come up to b3, which would be attacking both the knight and the pawn. And you'll, you'll notice that the pawn is actually under a tw uh, attack twice now, uh, once by the knight and once by the queen. So in order to keep the bishop, I'm sorry, in, so in order to keep the knight on that square, uh, black is forced to play pawn to a5, but after pawn to a3, uh, black has to retreat the knight to c6, and then there goes the pawn on d5. So that's why in this position, um, black does not capture the pawn and instead uh, plays its knight now from c8 out to e7. Here the game continues as follows. We have uh, the pawn pushing up to b5, and white puts its uh, knight now on a5. Now it, it is looking a little silly on the rim of the board, but you'll notice that it has this uh, really nice square here on c4 to jump to, which it will be doing shortly. And once it gets there, it's going to be uh, a really big pain for white to deal with. From here now, finally, uh, white puts the question to the bishop with h3, and the bishop decides to simply capture uh, the knight, and white recaptures. Uh, from here, Black pushes the pawn to c6, and Larson, in looking at this game later, uh, made the comment about this position that what's really nice about it is there aren't really a lot of weaknesses, uh, if any, that white can uh, swing to its advantage. Um, you know, it has this awkwardly knight, uh, awkwardly placed knight here, but it's going to jump into uh, c4 momentarily, and everything else is strung together and really nicely protected. Um, white is going to have to try to really think of something uh, in order to bust up uh, the center or make any sort of advance against black. So from here, white plays the queen to d3, and now the knight jumps into c4. Uh, this was attacking the uh, bishop, so the bishop jumps uh, up to f4, and then the knight goes to g6 and attacks the bishop again, and the bishop tucks itself into h2. Probably not the most active square. Uh, yes, it is impacting this diagonal that goes uh, through the center from uh, h2 to b8, but again, it's just not uh, as active as it could have been. From here, we have the bishop to g5, and white initiates an exchange of pawns on c6. From here, um, we have the bishop from white pulling back to d1 again just a questionable move i'm not quite sure what uh what white was thinking of doing what white was hoping to achieve with this move uh from here black pushes the uh the bishop up to f4 which is going to exchange off the dark square bishops uh white doesn't uh, go for that right away though and instead puts the uh bishop onto c2 now this is an attack that i think you'll see uh fairly regularly in chess uh with the queen protected i'm sorry supported by the uh bishop bearing down on the castle position the problem with this though is that with this knight here currently uh this is not that big of an attack uh the the knight is stopping that attack cold so in response to this uh black takes the opportunity to exchange off the dark square bishops and from here the queen jumps up to f6 now um i'm pretty i think that what uh Black was, I'm sorry, what White was looking to do in this position is protect the square f4, and the only way that it could do it was to push the pawn to g3. This is keeping the knight off of this square, which it probably would have jumped to eventually, you know, once the, the mate threat was dealt with, with uh, pushing one of these pawns or giving the king an escape square or protecting uh, h7 for an additional time. But eventually this knight would have jumped to f4, and that would have been uh, pretty bad for uh, white because the knight would have been really close to the uh, white king. So to prevent that, white plays the pawn to g3, but in doing so, of course, it's weakening its uh, the squares around the king uh, a, a little further. From here, black pushes uh, the rook over to f8. I'm sorry, rook from f to e8. And uh, the king goes to g2 again just to move. I'm not quite sure what this move is trying to accomplish. Uh, it just seems to me like maybe Gipsless was a little uh, flustered or just not thinking clearly. I don't know what this move uh, really gives uh, white in this position. Now from here, uh, black plays the queen to g5, uh, which is a, a pretty sharp move. It's now pinning this pawn down to g3, so the pawn is no longer able to defend 
f4, which would mean that this knight could jump in, and that would be forking the king and the queen, and that would be game over. So to prevent that, uh, the king plays back to h2. From here, uh, the knight jumps to b2, which is attacking the queen, and the queen runs to f3, but now white is able, I'm sorry, black is able to get its queen on a really monstrous square, which is b2. And if you look at it, this queen is attacking three undefended pieces. Uh, the bishop on c2, the knight on c3, and the pawn on d4 are all unprotected in this position. So uh, in order to kind of save as much material as possible, white is forced to exchange on uh, g6. Once black recaptures, white jumps the knight to d1, uh, where it is protected by the rooks and the queen. From here, uh, black jumps the queen, I'm sorry, black jumps the knight back to c4. And we have uh, from white queen to c3, which is offering a queen exchange. Uh, black doesn't go for that right away, though, and instead activates its other rook and slides it onto the open b file. From here, uh, we have rook to c1, uh, bishop, I'm um, sorry, rook up to e4, and then after the rook goes to attack the queen, now the pawn on d4 falls, and that results in a queen exchange on d4. From here, white uh, plays its own rook over to e1, grabbing control of the e file. And black decides to start pushing his pawn on the a-file. Uh, the king plays over to g2. Again, not quite sure what that move was uh, designed to try to accomplish. Black pushes the pawn again. Here, uh, black, I'm sorry, white plays the knight to uh, c3, attacking the pawn. And the pawn just simply pushes to a3, where it's out of the reach of the knight. Uh, here, the knight goes to a4. And then uh, black pushes his pawn on, onto g5. From here, uh, white gets a rook onto the seventh rank, and uh, black puts its rook on the uh, fourth rank. And the rooks aren't connected quite yet because of this knight here on uh, c4, but once the knight moves, these rooks are going to be really monstrous. And as it stands, this rook on b4 is attacking the knight, so the knight now plays to b6. From here, uh, black offers a rook exchange on b2 and it is not in white's best interest to take that rook exchange for example what would happen is uh, white can capture black can recapture with the pawn that pawn is one step away from promotion so black has to play back its other rook to e1 from there white i'm sorry black can exchange the knights on b6 and after the rook slides over to b4 this is just a lost game because this passed pawn isn't going to get very far uh, this pawn is one step away from promotion, and these two pawns are also going to come down and uh, create a lot of problems very quickly here. So uh, that's why, faced with this position, white uh, did not go for the rook exchange and instead played its rook to c3. Uh, from here, Larson just pretty much put the finishing touches on the game. Uh, he played his uh, rook over to a2 and captured the pawn, which makes room for uh, the a pawn to come down. Here, black, I'm sorry, white uh, exchanges the knights on c4. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Larson captured with the pawn. Uh, I was wondering why Larson didn't capture in this position with the uh, the rook, because um, then he would have had still connected past pawns, and he could have uh, maybe forced a rook exchange, which again would have been in black's favor. Uh, so if you have any thoughts about that, about why Larson captured with the pawn and not with the rook, I'd uh, definitely be interested in hearing them. Uh, but as it is, uh, he recaptured with the pawn. Uh, black goes and attacks the uh, pawn on c7. Uh, white just doubles up the rooks on the second rank. And after uh, white goes uh, to f3 with its rook to defend against the battery leading into the king here on f2, uh, black just pushes its pawn to c3 and white resigns because uh, there, there are two passed pawns in the position. They're both really close to promotion. Uh, white has to defend against this battery uh, on the king, but there's no way to do both that job and uh, keep these pawns from uh, from promoting. So that's why in this position, uh, white resigned. So yeah, that's the Grandmaster game on the Alakines exchange variation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching the video. If you have any questions or comments, uh, of course, I'd love to hear them. And uh, yeah, take care. Bye.